going to be on thermodynamics. So we've kind of already been talking about thermodynamics in a sense in the last uh, couple of lectures, particularly talking about temperature and heat exchange or heat transfer, phase changes, right? All that has to do with thermodynamics. So we're going to do here as the last lecture in this part of the course is talk kind of broadly about thermodynamics and uh, specifically about what are called the uh, laws of thermodynamics. So what is thermodynamics? Put it simply, uh, it's the study of heat and how heat transforms into different kinds of energy. So that should be sounding familiar because uh, we've been talking a lot about heat and how it transfers to different uh, materials and how it changes the phase of those materials, heats them up, that sort of stuff. So there's uh, some foundational principles uh, of thermodynamics and those are the conservation of energy, so energy is conserved overall, it might transform into different kinds but it's still uh, doesn't just disappear, and uh, the fact that heat flows spontaneously from hot to cold and not the other way around. So another way of saying that is heat always naturally flows from a hotter object to a colder object. So along with these principles, in conjunction with this atomic theory of matter that we've been talking about for a little while, pretty much makes up the foundations of thermodynamics. So just to remind you that the atomic theory of, nat of matter is essentially just that matter, you know, me, you, the camera, uh, tables, food, chairs, all that kind of stuff, uh, is made up of atoms, and beyond that, those atoms are always in motion, and um, in general, there's these three sorts of main states of matter, which was uh, solids, liquids, and gases. Uh, for the most part, it's just more and more motion involved at the atomic level as we go from solid to liquid to gas. Um, so just to remind you about temperature overall and um, the fact that we have these different temperature scales, which are, um, if you remember, uh, a temperature is just a measurement of the average uh, kinetic energy of all the atoms that make up a material. Or more simply put, a measure of the average amount of motion that's going on inside of the material. Right? That's how what temperature really measures. Um, so we have these different scales. We have Celsius, Fahrenheit, Kelvin scale. And Kelvin, the Kelvin scale is pegged at zero being uh, what we call absolute zero. And taking that temperature as a measure of kind of motion of all those atoms, absolute zero is when there's no more motion going on. Okay, so these laws of thermodynamics, right? So the first law of thermodynamics um, is essentially a statement of energy conservation. One way of putting it is that uh, whenever you add heat to a system, that heat is energy, and that energy transforms into some other kind of energy in that system. So kind of put it as a, maybe a sort of equation here, the heat that you add to a system is going to equal the increase in the internal energy of that system, and so that's saying the increase in the temperature, basically, of that system, and, or plus, the work done by that system. So work done by a system, the simplest example of work done by a system is when something like a gas expands and it pushes against something. And so our work was just this force being applied over a distance, so when a gas expands, it would say push on something else to move it along. Right? So that's some work that can be done. So there's an alternative way of putting this, is essentially where you talk about put the work that's happening on the other side of this equation, and now it says that uh, the heat added to a system plus the work done on the system, now you're like compressing something, is going to be equal to the increase in internal energy of that system. So both of these, again, are just essentially statements about conservation of energy. If you're adding heat to a system, that heat is, some, is energy and it goes to increasing internal energy or to doing work uh, by the system. These uh, laws are a little bit difficult to think about um, and 
best to give some examples. So uh, one example might be water. If you put a pot of water on a burner, an electric burner, a gas burner, a stove, whatever you want to call it, right? When you do that, uh, there's heat coming from that burner and it's being added to the water. Technically, it's going through the pan, conducting through the pan, but we talked about that conduction. So imagine that heat is essentially going to the water. Right? So we're adding heat to that system. The system is the water that's in the pot. And that heat is now going into increasing the internal energy of the water, of the H2O molecules, essentially raising the temperature of that water. It's also going into work that's being done by the system. Uh, that is because the water, as it heats up, expands. So remember we talked about thermal expansion. When something is heated up, it generally is going to expand. So when this water expands, it's actually pushing against the atmosphere, right? The air that's above it. There's a whole bunch of pressure from the air above. So in order for that water to expand, it has to actually do work to push against that air. So that's an example of that first form of the, the first law of thermodynamics. A uh, second example that's kind of interesting, more along the lines of the second form, where you actually do work on a system in order to increase the internal energy in that system, it is something called a uh, fire syringe, or sometimes it's called a fire piston, um, where essentially you do work on air that's inside of a piston, and you're not adding any heat actually in that case, so all of the work that you're doing is just going to increase in the internal energy of the air, and usually there's a little piece of uh, cotton or some kind of tinder or something in that piston. And so as you push down on the piston, right, you're doing work on that piston, you're increasing the internal energy. So that air inside of the piston heats up very, depending on how quickly you push it down, it heats up quite a bit. Right? It heats up so much that it actually causes the uh, cotton inside of that syringe to combust. Right? The cotton gets so hot because the air is heating up, it'll combust. So let's see an example of that. And here we go, we're closing up the piston, push it down real fast, and we see a spark. Here's a little slow motion. And there we go. So no heat being added there, it was all work being done on the air inside of that piston. Okay, so um, how about a couple more examples of this uh, first law of thermodynamics? So another way of looking at this is that if uh, a system or a substance or a material or whatnot, if that does work on something else, by that system doing work, it's going to decrease its internal energy, right? Essentially, there's energy going out of the system now. An example of that would be if you blow air out of your lips, right? if you kind of push your lips together, and you push air out through a very like small opening here. Right? What you're doing is you're forcing air to come through a very small opening, so you're kind of compressing the air. And as it comes out, it hits the atmosphere and it's expanding as it comes out. So to expand, it needs to do work on the air that's in there, right? It needs to push the air out of the way. So it's doing work on the air that's already there it's by expanding. And that way, it's actually decreasing its internal energy. That's why the air feels cool. Another example of work being done on a substance in order to increase its internal energy is actually similar to the fire syringe. This is a example of a diesel engine, a four-stroke uh, diesel engine, where in uh, a normal engine, or in most, a lot of engines, not diesel engines, um, there's actually what's called spark plug. And as part of the engine cycle, the spark plug will uh, spark in order to ignite the fuel um, inside the engine. It ignites that, that kind of gives you the uh, power stroke that pushes the piston down to turn the crankshaft and whatnot. But in a diesel engine, uh, there actually is no spark plug. All that happens is there's these sort of four steps where on the uh, intake, the piston's kind of moving downward and so the fuel is being uh, input into that uh, piston area above the piston. And so as the piston goes down, there's that fuel coming in, 
and then as the piston comes back around and pushes up, it's compressing that fuel. So we're doing work on the fuel, meaning we're increasing the internal energy of that fuel. So we're increasing the internal energy, increasing the temperature, and the piston comes up, 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 and eventually it compresses it enough, it's done enough work on it to increase its temperature, its internal energy enough that the fuel just spontaneously ignites, no spark necessary. And then you get the expansion where the piston gets pushed back down by that uh, exploding combusting fuel. And then finally, uh, the exhaust where the piston pushes that ex uh, combusted fuel out of the um, cylinder. So how about a little check on yourself? So this is an example of work being done on a system, namely when you compress air in a tire pump, right? So like you know, uh, have one of those hand pumps where you're trying to pump air into your tire, right? So you push down on a piston, you're compressing the air there. The temperature of that system, or particularly the air compressing, what happens to it? Does it decrease or increase? Does it decrease or remain unchanged? Or is it no longer? And we just don't know. So go ahead and we hit pause and think about that for a second. And hopefully, you said that the uh, temperature will increase. Right? We're doing work on the system, meaning we're increasing the internal energy of that system. So another uh, interesting place where the first law of thermodynamics comes into uh, or affects us, I guess, on a daily basis, is in meteorology or the in weather study of weather. So uh, sort of consequence or another way of sort of stating this uh, first law is that air temperature, air temperature rises as heat is added or as the pressure is increased, right? So just like that tire pump, we push down it, we compressed it, we increased the pressure, the temperature rose. We could also alternatively have just added heat in a different way. Air temperature so um, this sort of process of uh, air temperature rising or uh, falling, depending on uh, heat added or being taken away, it occurs regularly in the atmosphere. And um, you can sort of think about um, the atmosphere is made up of sort of like uh, chunks or what we call sometimes parcels of air. So there's sort of a big uh, piece of air, and that air will sort of move around in the atmosphere and around in the rest of the atmosphere. Um, and it turns out there's not a whole lot of heat that gets uh, exchanged, at least quickly. So as the air temperature will rise and fall depending on essentially just the pressure of that air. So here you get a little picture of that, where um, you have this sort of parcel of air, and sort of chunk of air, and it's much uh, maybe a kilometer above uh, ground level and it's at 15 degrees Celsius. So that little parcel is maybe warmer than the air around it so it's less dense than the air around it so it wants to rise. So as it rises the pressure becomes less and less. So as you, if you go up in the atmosphere, if you remember, pressure is going to decrease. So the parcel of air is rising the pressure is lessening, so the air is going to expand and it's actually going to lower its temperature. So again, just kind of keep going up. Imagine keep going up. It continues to move up and up and up, and as it rises more and more and more, the pressure around there is less and less and less, so the temperature of that parcel of air decreases. It gets cooler and cooler air as you sort of move up in the atmosphere. So this is also evident in rain, uh, formation of rain, and how sort of temperature changes around uh, large land masses or large uh, mountains. For instance, if you have this mass of air or parcel of air and it's on the one side of this mountain and the left side of this mountain, it's warmer and less uh, dense or uh, lower pressure down uh, here at this ground level. And as that air moves up along the mountain, it's getting up to lower uh, pressure. And so the temperature is dropping. As the temperature drops, the water vapor in that uh, air cools down, and it cools down, uh, well, it can cool down enough to actually change phase from water vapor, from gas, 
to being a uh, liquid. So essentially that temperature drop is energy coming out of all of that water vapor and enough of it comes out that it changes phase into being water. So that's why you can get a lot of rain on one side of the mountain if there's some air, generally a wind air currents that uh, go towards it. So the opposite happens on the other side of that mountain where after that air has condensed or it's uh, gone up the mountain, it's cooled off and you've got rain coming out, you have that cold, moist air coming down the other side. Uh, but since it's cold now, right, uh, it's more dense than a lot of the air on the other side. And so it's more dense, it's going to drop, it's not buoyant. It starts to drop coming down the other side of the mountain and as it drops, right, the pressure is getting greater. So it's kind of compressing. As the pressure gets greater, the temperature increases. So then you get these sort of warm, now dry, if it did rain on one side, warm and dry when it's coming on the other side. And this uh, particularly happens apparently going over the Rocky Mountains where you get these uh, Chinook winds uh, going towards the Great Plains after this uh, moist air has come off from the west side of the Rocky Mountains. Okay, so on to the second law of thermodynamics, and we're not actually going to really go into the third law. It's kind of a techni technical one, um, so the second law will be all we're going to do, but there's a good bit to talk about. The second law is also uh, sort of a complicated thing, but uh, there are ways to understand it on this uh, sort of conceptual level that we're talking about. So one way of stating the second law of thermodynamics is something we've already talked about multiple times, or I've mentioned multiple times, and that is that uh, heat will never spontaneously flow from a cold object to a hot object. Another way of saying heat will naturally or spontaneously flow from hot objects to cold objects. Um, so some examples of heat naturally flowing from hot to cold would be, say, uh, you know, on a summer day, heat is naturally going to flow from uh, the hot air that's outside uh, to the cooler air that might be inside. Uh, the opposite would happen in winter, right? Maybe there's warmer air inside and that uh, heat uh, will naturally flow uh, to the cold or outside. Another example might be if you accidentally place your hand on a hot stove right, or like an electric burner, then the heat will naturally flow from the burner onto your hand. Not a good idea, but that's the natural course of things. Saying it never spontaneously flows from cold to hot doesn't mean it can't flow from cold to hot. Right? It just means that some effort needs to be put in in order for heat to be forced to flow from cold to hot. So some examples of systems uh, where heat will flow in the opposite direction that it naturally wants to flow is refrigerators and air conditioners. So in refrigerators, or actually we use a, a series of things in order to actually draw, essentially draw heat out of the stuff, out of the inside of the refrigerator and expel it outside the refrigerator. And the same sort of thing about air conditioners. Air conditioners essentially drawing heat out of the interior of your home to uh, push it outside. So another interesting uh, place where the second law um, kind of touches us day to day is what's known as a heat engine. So a heat engine is essentially a, any sort of device which can convert heat energy into mechanical work. So essentially taking some kind of heat energy and maybe pushing something or turning something or uh, that sort of thing. And the way that it works, so the very basic idea of a heat engine is that uh, you take heat from some high temperature area or reservoir and your heat engine essentially extracts some work out of it and expels the rest of that heat to a lower temperature reservoir. Which generally that expelling that, that part is generally called the exhaust from the engine. So essentially the second law of thermodynamics actually says tells us that a heat engine is never going to be able to entirely transform all of that high temperature heat energy into work. The second law will tell us that part of that uh, high temperature heat is always going to be expelled as a low temperature. So 
never quite get all of that uh, heat energy to convert to work. We're doing some work. There's always some exhaust. And hopefully you recall that uh, work is again another form of like, amount of energy. So they're both measured in joules. They're all the same stuff. It's just being converted from one kind of form to another. So let's see an example of this heat engine, right? So uh, some, in the early days when we people will start being able to make heat engines, one of the first things we made was a steam engine. So in a steam engine, as you can see in the diagram, well, one example of a steam engine, you have water and by some methods, like in this uh, image, you're using burning coal in order to uh, heat up that water. So you have water and you heat it up enough to let it boil, so you create steam. So, right, so the steam comes in to this piston area, right, and that incoming steam is essentially that high temperature. That's where that high temperature heat is coming from. So it comes in and it wants to push that piston that pushes in the same mountain this way here, and as the steam comes in, it wants to cool off and expand and push that piston out. So it's doing some mechanical work by pushing that piston, and that piston pushes the crankshaft, which turns the wheel. But the mechanical work directly is being done on the piston in order to push it. So once it's pushed it, that steam is expanded, it's cooled down, it's done some mechanical work, but now we have slightly cooler steam and when the piston comes back around, it pushes that cooler steam back out and it goes out the top of the train. That's where you get your exhaust. So that piston pushing it back out, pushing that lower temperature steam back out, that's our low temperature, essentially heat that's coming back out. Let's jump back real quick, right? To our basic diagram for a heat engine, we have our high temperature steam heat coming in, part of that uh, energy is able to work by pushing the piston, but not all of it is expended. There's still energy left, and that energy is that low temperature steam that gets pushed out of uh, the exhaust pipe. So, one reason that the second law of thermodynamics is a little bit tricky is that there's a lot of different ways to uh, state it. That's just some maybe an unfortunate thing, but uh, it is what it is. So let's look at another way that you could state the second law of thermodynamics. Order naturally tends towards disorder. So what do we mean by that? Um, well, if you compare, say, uh, a gas to a solid, right? so compare ice maybe to uh, steam, you know, the ice is much more orderly. Right? It's in this crystal form. Right? All the atoms are sort of in their nice little places. They're jiggling around, but they're all very nicely arranged. Right? It's a very ordered sort of setup. Versus now the steam, which you have the H2O molecules that are free to move around. There's all this random chaotic motion. Right? It's very disorderly. Okay? So that's sort of one way of understanding what we mean by order versus disorder. So the second law says that order naturally tends towards disorder. So when you have a system that's very ordered, it kind of naturally over time tends towards being disordered. So um, a nice example of that uh, that we've seen already was uh, dry ice. If you just have dry ice in a room, in a room, a room temperature, uh, that dry ice is a solid, right? It's a, a solid form of uh, carbon dioxide, CO2. And we saw last, last time, uh, one of the previous ones, that dry ice actually sublimates at atmospheric pressure, meaning it goes directly from a solid to a gas. So it's nice and easy to see that we start out with this solid and placing it in room temperature, it spontaneously wants to sublimate and become a gas. Okay, so order naturally tends towards disorder. That doesn't mean that disordered things can't become orderly, like uh, steam can't become water or uh, ice, but for that to happen, generally you need to expend some kind of energy in order to do that. A lot of times you need to put in some work in some way. So some examples of this are if you have like a just random pile of bricks, pretty disordered sort of setup, haphazard sort of thing, um, you can make it into an orderly setup 
by putting in some work, right? By putting, picking up each of the bricks, placing them down nicely, and you can stack them up into this nice little pyramid shape. So that's one example of uh, disorder becoming order, but you need to work in order to do that. Another big example of uh, disorder things becoming more orderly is, generally speaking, for living organisms or biological life. Right? Biological life, by and large, is organisms taking disordered things and sort of using utilizing uh, energy in order to form things that are more orderly. Right? So, like we take in food in order to sustain our body, which is a very sort of orderly uh, system in general. So finally, or the final statement we'll say about the second law of thermodynamics um, is sometimes stated in terms of uh, this thing called entropy, which you may have heard of before, but on a very basic level, entropy is just is essentially a measure of the disorder of a system. And so if a system is very disordered, you could say it's a very high entropy. Or if it's a very orderly system, very low entropy. So essentially, order disorder increases in a system, entropy increases. So for instance, going back to these example, or this example, right? The system when or the state when all the bricks were all messed up is a very or a more high entropy state, those bricks, versus a lower entropy state uh, when the bricks are all in a nice and row here stacked up. And so that final restatement of the second law of thermodynamics is that the entropy of the universe tends to increase. Or the entropy actually in any system in general will tend to increase, naturally increase. And again, some examples of that are liquid phases of a material sort of naturally, or sorry, solid phases of material naturally changing into a liquid phase, right? So a liquid, uh, phase of, say, H2O, water, right? liquid phase is much more disordered than the solid phase. Again, the solid phase is, you know, all these atoms, the H2O molecules are sort of stuck in this rows and columns sort of uh, setup, versus the water uh, phase is those molecules are now able to move around quite a bit. So there's a lot more disorder in the liquid than in the solid. And if you ever have an ice cube, then, you know, you have it out, naturally it tends to want to uh, melt and become uh, water. So that's the entropy of the system naturally increasing. And finally this uh, setup where if you take say coffee and cream and somehow set it up to begin with where this system of coffee and cream is completely separate. You have coffee below here, you have cream above here. That's a very or relatively ordered setup of the system. It's nicely separated. But the natural tendency of that system is going to be for those uh, two liquids to combine. So if you were to start with that system immediately, the cream would start to fall through and it would start to mix in with uh, the coffee. And over time, uh, natural, so what we call diffusion, would essentially make it so that the cream and the coffee eventually would be completely mixed up. Right? You wouldn't have to do anything. It would take a while to get it completely mixed up. But you see that process going immediately when it's the cream sort of falls, uh, starts to mix with the coffee. Going from that ordered state where they're completely separate to the more disordered state where they're mixed up. So lower entropy state, higher entropy state. So lastly, I'll give you another little question here. So if you had a locker, I don't know if you've ever had a locker, but imagine you can imagine you do. So say your locker gets messier each week and say this uh, semester goes by. In this case, the entropy of your locker is going to be what's happening to that entropy. Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Is it remaining the same? Or is it not existing? There's no entropy there. Let's go ahead and think about that for a minute. Let's pause if you need to. And hopefully you answered that it is increasing, right? Becoming more messy, messier means it's becoming more disordered, means its entropy is increasing. If in fact you were, you start out with a messy locker and you spend some time organizing it each week, then that would be a case where you're actually putting in work in order to decrease the entropy of the system. Right? You're making it go from a disordered state to a more orderly state, decreasing its entropy.
Okay, so that's all for this portion of the course. Hopefully these online lectures are going to work out well. And I hope, uh, hope everyone's doing well. And, well, I don't know. Hopefully I'll see you at some point, but maybe not. If not, then just digitally. Um, and this should get us all the way to our exam and then spring break. And after spring break, I think we're going to be reassessing, but probably continue with online options. So, best wishes to all, and good night.